Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Faith Lutheran Mission Church. My name is Nick Kensler, pastor here at the church. Good morning to everyone sitting in our pews, and good morning to everyone who is watching us online. Kayla's going to bring us into the presence of the Lord with some music. I ask you to open up your hearts and minds for what God has to say for you today.
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we, we confess that we are not to sin, to sin and cannot forgive ourselves. We, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will, and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, forgives us all of our sins. As a call to an ordained minister of Lutheran congregations and mission for Christ and by God's authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
my God, your resurrected son is the promise that someday we also will have resurrected bodies with you in heaven. Lord, while we are still on earth, ignite your Holy Spirit fire within us so that we can do the mission you have called each of us to do through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit as one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. with the eleven other apostles and shouted to the crowd, So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church about 3,000 in all. Today's song is Psalm 116, and we'll read responsibly. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I called upon him. The cords of death entangled me, the grip of the grave took hold of me. I came to grief and sorrow. When I called upon the name of the Lord, O Lord, I pray to you, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and the righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord watches over the innocent. I was brought very low, and he helped me. Turn again to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has treated you well. For you have rescued my life from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. I will, I will walk, walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. I believed even when I said, I have been brought very low. In my distress I said, no one can be trusted. How, How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. The second reading this morning is taken from the first Peter in chapter 1. And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no faithfulness. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now, in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. Through Christ you have come to trust in God, and you have placed your faith and hope in God, because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. 
So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living Word of God. As the scriptures say, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. This is gospel. Please rise as you are I'm sorry, this ends the reading. Please rise as you are able to the gospel. <laughs> Shall we go? Do this, 
we really need to remember the context of what was happening at the time Jesus talked with these uh, two discouraged guys on the way to Emmaus. Now, early on that first Easter Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb that held the body of Jesus. They had rushed back to the disciples with the news that they had seen an angel who had told them that Jesus was risen. Peter and John then run to the tomb and discovered that, yes, indeed, the tomb was empty. On that very afternoon of the report of the empty tomb, two of the discouraged disciples had become frustrated to the point that they were heading back to their home in Emmaus. These two were disastrously discouraged and were thrown in the towel and heading home. Yet on the way, they meet a stranger. It was actually the risen Jesus. However, they didn't recognize him. Part of the delight of this account in Luke's Gospel is that we, the readers, know what the characters involved do not. So let's take a look at three dangers of discouragement that our scripture text warns us about today. First danger of discouragement is that it can cause us to walk away from the fellowship of believers. Verses 14 through 16 tell us this. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. As the two disciples were walking, they were moving away from the fellowship of the other believers in Jerusalem. <clears throat> and we know that same thing happens to Christians today. When believers allow themselves to become preoccupied with their discouragement and frustrated plans, all too often, they also withdraw from the strength found in the fellowship of being with other believers. In our gospel text for today, for some reason, the eyes of these disciples were restrained from recognizing who Jesus was. And I think that this is so that the disciples could verbalize their feelings for which Jesus could then lead them to solve their problems by seeing the truth for themselves. Now the two disciples were discouraged because they had forgotten some truths. And one of those truths were what God promised in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Folks, remember that whenever you feel like walking away from the Lord and his fellowship of believers, that it is you doing the walking away and not the Lord walking away from you. God loves you and wants to be with you so that he can help you through whatever problem you might be going through. Don't walk away in your discouragement. This brings us to the second danger, and that is discouragement can cause us to live in the past. Let's take a look at verses 17 through 18. He asked them, what are you discussing so intensely as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there in the last few days. <clears throat> Jesus joins the two disciples as they walk along and are deep in a discussion with each other. And Jesus senses their intensity when he asks them, what are you discussing so intensely as you walk along? The Greek word used here for the phrase discussing so intensely is the word antabano, which means to exchange words in opposition as in a debate. 
And the word actually has a context of two teams throwing a ball at each other in competition. So think of it as dodgeball, except with words. In their bewilderment, the disciples were tossing ideas back and forth about what they had heard and what it all meant. So Jesus asks them what they are discussing and why they are so obviously sad. And it's in asking this question, Jesus is allowing the disciples to express their deepest hurts, their frustrations, and their discouragement. Isn't it interesting, though, that Jesus came to two people who were completely obscure as to what was happening with the other disciples back in the locked upper room in Galilee. Folks, we can take heart today in the fact that Jesus often made his most remarkable revelations to the least remarkable people. Here we see two people who are never, never heard of before and never seen again in the verses in the Bible. Which should point out to us that there are no unimportant people to Jesus. So as he joins these two disciples, Jesus already knows their hearts and their needs. However, Jesus still asked them a leading question so as to give them an opportunity to pour out their confusion and discouragement. Church, Jesus hasn't changed. He will still draw near to us and listen as we tell him what troubles us. So as the disciple Cleopas hears Jesus' question, he is amazed and says, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened here the last few days. And don't you love that response from Jesus in verse 19? What things? It was during their journey away from Jerusalem that these two disciples were having a living in the past kind of faith. And in the remainder of verses 19 through 21, they start to list the things that Jesus was. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said, he was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. The two disciples summed up their condition very neatly when they said in verse 21, We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. The two discouraged disciples stated, We had hoped. Now to you English grammar scholars out there, you know that that word is definitely a past tense participle. So just this one little phrase strongly implies that, that they were now living in the past and now had nothing left except hopelessness and discouragement. Without a doubt, the saddest death of all has to be the death of hope. Now these men had hoped. However, now the flame of hope was all but distinguished. So this then brings us to the third danger of discouragement, which is to question God's care. Now, we might have expected Jesus to respond by saying, Yeah, hey guys, I understand. It's okay. However, in verse 25, Jesus replies quite strongly against the disciples' discouragement. Jesus says this, You foolish people! You find it so hard to believe in all that the prophets wrote in the scripture. When Jesus says that the disciples were finding it hard to believe all that the prophets have spoken, 
This indicates that the disciples had been somewhat selective in what they were going to believe and hope in. These two disciples believed part of the Word of God, but not all. The men had been guilty of believing the Word of God selectively and believing only those things that fit in with the, within their neat little box that they had created for God. And so their understanding of Scripture was worked out by their own assumptions and preconceptions. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? How many people read the Bible today with their own preconceived assumptions of, of what is and isn't true and what God has to say in His Holy Word? And this is how discouragement and heartbreak happen in a person's relationship with God. Some people think God should do something based on their faulty knowledge of His Word. And then they get discouraged when God doesn't do it. They think that God has left, let them down and doesn't care. However, the problem is not with God, folks. The problem is with us. God's words are not meant to harm or insult, but rather to challenge and subsequently strengthen our faith and belief. So what question about God's truth and care are you asking about right now? Let me comfort you with a couple of verses from God's holy word that will strengthen you and give you hope in uh, this time of discouragement. First book of Peter, chapter 5, verse 7, promises us this. Give all your worries and cares to God, for He cares about you. And listen to these words from the first, uh, fourth book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 19. Fourth, Philippians 4, 19. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now, in our gospel text, even when starting out with some tough words, Jesus reminds the two men of the promises made about him in scriptures of the Old Testament. And Jesus brings back hope and encouragement by saying in verses 26 through 27, wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Beginning in Genesis, with the promised sacrifice in Genesis, Chapter 3, verse 15, way back in Genesis. And going through the suffering serpent then, when we read in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 through 8. And also, the pierced one in the book of Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10. And of course, there's the messenger of the covenant in the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 1. Jesus reestablishes the hope of the promised Messiah that was made back in the Old Testament. And so, as we, the two, tra travel along with these two travelers, reading about their journey, and they are approaching the end of that journey, the stranger appears to be continuing his journey. And verses 28 through 29 tell us this. By this time they were near Emmaus, and the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us, since it is getting late. So he went home with them. Traveling at night was both difficult and dangerous, so the men insisted that Jesus stay with them. And verses 30 through 31 then reveal to us the incredible miracle that happens next. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened, 
and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. Now notice the response of the two men immediately after this miracle. Were they frightened, thinking that they had seen a ghost? Were they now even more discouraged, thinking that they lost yet another ghost? No, not at all. Check out verses 32 through 34. They said to each other, Didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And when within the hour they were on their way back to Jerusalem, there they found the eleven disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, The Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. The hearts of the two disciples went from discouragement to dynamic. Are any of you feeling discouraged today? Let me read to you some words that were written by Mark Buchanan of the experience he went through when he was discouraged. And he wrote this in his book, Your God is Too Safe. Listen to these words he wrote. I hit the ground running. Immediately I volunteered for everything, anything that I felt vaguely interested in and marginally qualified for. I led the youth group. I helped with the music. I taught Sunday school. I wrote the church newsletter. I became a camp counselor. I served as a mentor to several young men. But something, somewhere, went awry. The zeal fizzled. The fire in my bones became only an ache in my joints. My running became plotting. My lightness became heaviness. My joyfulness became jadedness. I joined the ranks of the murmurers and fault finders. Those that did not like the music or the sermon or the color of the flowers behind the church. And I found their number legion. Does that story sound familiar, familiar to any of you today? The, the truth is, that God does want to set our hearts on fire. He wants to give us a burning passion for life. We all long for the eternal. However, we're too easily contented with the temporary. If that might be describing you today, remember these words when the Apostle Paul speaks to a person who's like a son to him. And he says this in the second book of Corinthians, I'm sorry, the second book of Timothy, chapter 1, verse 6. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. The Lord gave these disciples a passion and a purpose where all there had been was pain. And it came from two things that are still basic to a relationship with Jesus today. Spending time with him through prayer and spending time in the Bible. A burning heart can be found and rekindled with these two things. So here's the result of those once discouraged disciples. Uh, although by this point it was already late, these guys were on fire, and they couldn't wait till the morning. Check out verse 33. And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. Those once discouraged but now dynamic disciples absolutely have to tell someone about what has happened. They needed to share their experience. And no one in Emmaus would understand. So, back to their fellow believers they go. Because the disciples knew they would definitely understand. And one of the best signs of recovery from discouragement is a desire to be back among other believers. The long, discouraging walk to Emmaus now became a joyous run to Jerusalem with a renewed strength and encouragement. Folks, do you need your eyes opened once again to the presence of Jesus? 
then ask God today for you to feel once again a burning heart to live for him without discouragement. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the promises of hope that are in your holy word. Lord, we are sorry when we walk away, live in the past, and question your care for us. Help us, Heavenly Father, to ignite a passion for the truth of your Son Jesus and fan the flames for us to continue in sharing salvation through your Son Jesus Christ by word and deed through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Our next hymn is He Leadeth Me, O Blessed Thought. Still working on the green hymn yet? This is hymn number 501, which will also be up on the screen. Yeah. 
rise as you are able for the Apostles' Creed. And let's all proclaim together the words of our Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs, Lord God. As we go a little past Easter here and on, pretty soon getting closer to Pentecost, Lord, we need some fire. We need some Holy Spirit fire, Lord, within us, Lord. Uh, ignite within us, Lord, that flame you have created within us, Lord. Fan those flames brightly and strongly, Lord. And remind us that you have called each of us to do something to build your kingdom here in this city, in this county, in this country, and to the continents. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. And Lord, we pray for this country. We pray for peace to be throughout this country. We pray for a reconciliation between people, Lord, and that's only going to happen through your love. Lord, help us show that love to each other, to the people around us, Lord. Lord, as a congregation, we promise to continue to pray for this nation, for our president, all the way down to our school boards and city councils. Lord, ignite that flame within us, but let it also be a flame of love and understanding and reconciliation. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our, our prayer. prayer. Father God, we especially pray for those people that are putting their lives on the line for this nation. Soldiers, family and friends who are far away from the people that they know and love, Lord. And they're doing it for us, Lord. Protect them. Keep them safe while they are out on mission. When that mission is completed, Lord, bring them home. Reunite them once again with family and friends. And Lord, remind us then that we've got to stand by them as they stood by for us. We've got to help them back in society again, help them with that transition, whether it's with a healing and body, mind, or spirit, or helping them with jobs, just helping them get back into life again. Lord, that's our responsibility. Remind us of that. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Why don't we also pray for those people putting their lives on the line in our own community? law enforcement, fire department, ambulance personnel, even emergency room personnel and hospitals, Lord, protect them while they are on shift. Lord, remind us, every time we hear a siren, we need to pray for that situation and pray for the safety of the responding officers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Lord, we pray also for those soldiers proclaiming your gospel truth in faraway lands. Father God, protect them. Keep them safe. Protect them from any kind of human evil. Protect them from the darts of Satan, Lord. And please provide them with the resources they need to do those ministries you have called them to. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. Lord, we continue to pray for those nations that are in conflict at this time. Israel, Ukraine, Sudan, Lord, so many more, Lord. We ask for your peace to come down. We ask for the resources needed to bring those nations back to peace again, Lord. And Lord, remind us, give us discernment and guidance and how is the best way to provide those things that are needed in each of those countries. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our, our prayer. Lord, we also continue to pray for the uh, states that have been ravaged by tornadoes already and we're just, we're just starting the season. We thank you. We thank you for organizations like Samaritan's Purse that go immediately and are on our boots on the ground handling these situations. Lord, help us help them through these organizations, Lord, and continue always, always to be praying. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. If there's anyone who has any prayers that they would like to make at this time, please go ahead and say them.
Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in the mercy of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. And also, also with you. Please share that peace of God with one another. At this time, I thank you in advance for your grateful and gracious hearts. Anyone who is watching us online that would like to provide towards our ministries here at Faith Lutheran Mission Church, address is at the bottom of the screen. If you write out a check and send to us, we promise we will be using it for building God's kingdom. Also, PayPal is available. And so, with the church on earth, 
and the hosts of heaven we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy. Now, may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Please rise as you are able for the benediction. Now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and give you his everlasting strength, peace, and protection. In the name of the Father. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Kids, you can head on down for Sunday school. The rest of us children of God have got one more hymn to sing. And that is Holy God, we praise your name. Again, still in the green hymn book. This hymn number 535. Words will also be up on the screen.